Hello everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Inigo Iriarte, Inigo Iri, and today we are changing the subject and we will talk about the knee and its ultrasound evaluation. This will be a, low, a, a beginner to intermediate level and I hope you like it. Let's go. We will begin with a small uh, brief introduction and then we will talk about the anterior side of the knee. And this will be the first video. Second video will be about the medial side of the knee. Third video about the lateral side. And fourth video about the posterior side. Okay, as an introduction, uh, saying that it's a very common pathology in sports, the knee injuries, and usually due to sports with pivot, jump, or sprint. So very, very common. And it's also common in general practice because of, of osteoarthritis uh, mainly and other pathologies like uh, rheumatological ones. Usually we can perform a very, very accurate um, diagnosis with only using our anamnesis and clinical exploration. And it's very, very interesting to perform this evaluation before performing the ultrasound scan because we will direct our ultrasound evaluation very very accurately and uh, this is uh, complementary okay so use always use your clinical skills to uh, evaluate first before the ultrasound this uh, joint is very very easily easily access with the uh, ultrasound to uh, direct uh, guided procedures and uh, so it's very, very uh, useful, the ultrasound. Okay. Which transducers will we use on, on the knee? Mainly the linear probe with 6 to 13, uh, 13 megahertz. Maybe 15, okay. But between, between 6 and 15 megahertz will cover, almost cover all the pathologies of the knee. Sometimes in, uh, we can use convex probes with 5 to 10 megahertz micro-convex probes. This um, sometimes in some patients, very particular patients, okay, maybe you can use um, sometimes these probes, but it's not frequent at all. Okay? And so is the evaluation with these high-frequency probes. Sometimes you will use uh, uh, 18 megahertz in uh, some bursitis, I don't know, some nerve evaluation, but it's not, not very common. Okay, so the first one will be your probe. There are several structures you, you can evaluate very, very accurately. For example, superficial ligaments, very, very common in our daily practice. So, um, the medial collateral ligament is very frequent, not as frequent as the lateral collateral ligament. Tendons, as you can uh, imagine, very, very frequent, very common. The patellar tendon, the quadricipital tendon, pesant serenus, iliotibial band, and biceps femoris. All are very, very well evaluated with ultrasound. Vessels, the tibial artery and, and veins. The nerves, the tibial nerve, and the common peroneal nerve, branches of the sciatic nerve, uh, can be evaluated very, very accurately and retinacula, the middle and lateral retinacula. Other structures are partially accessible to ultrasound. You can check, but this is not the uh, most indicated um, complementary exam to evaluate these structures. For example, to evaluate meniscus. If you suspect meniscus, always ask for MRI. Okay? But sometimes we can uh, take a look at the peripheral meniscus with the ultrasound and sometimes we will notice some pathologies like cysts, like uh, extrusions and even ruptures, tears of the meniscus, but not uh, a good uh, complementary exam to assess meniscus. Um, the trochlear and patellar cartilage are also partially viewed with the ultrasound you can ask uh, with some maneuvers, you can uh, check the cartilage, 
but some uh, areas of this cartilage will be hidden so you will not have a complete uh, assessment of the cartilage and so the best uh, complementary exam to assess cartilage is also is the MRI 2. The posterior cruciate ligament is the same. You can only check with ultrasound its distal insertion of the tibia. Okay, you can take a look, but always ask for an MRI. And not valuable at all with ultrasound to nowadays are the anterior cruciate ligament. You must always check with an MRI. The tibial cartilage, because it's hidden at the ultrasound, and deep ligaments of the posterior capsule uh, are, um, are, not, um, are not well assessed with ultrasound. So always, if you have a suspicion of these structures to be injured, just ask for an MRI. Okay, so let's start with the anterior side of the knee. Very, very well assessed with ultrasound. First of all, the position of the patient. I usually place the patient in a supine position and I use a pillow in order to achieve a flexion of the knee. 30 degrees, I usually prefer 40 or 45 degrees because it uh, tightens the uh, anterior uh, extensor mechanism, the um, structures, sorry, the quadripedal tendon, the patellar tendon are tightened in this position. So it's, um, you will have a more accurate view of these structures. So, which structures can we see in the anterior side of the knee? First of all, the quadricipital tendon. Okay. Second, the patellar tendon. You will also see the fat pad, the prefemoral fat pad, and the suprapatellar fat pad. The subquadricipital recess, here, you can see here, and bursae the prepatellar bursae and the infrapatellar, deep infrapatellar and superficial infrapatellar bursae. All these structures can be very very well checked with the ultrasound. So let's begin with the quadricipital tendon. Here you can see a cadaveric image and a three Tesla's MRI image uh, in a sagittal plane of the knee. And if we zoom into the quadricipital tendon, you will notice this three layer distribution here with the superficial layer, which is formed by the rectus femoris, and as you can see, continues superficial to the patella. The deep layer here, which is formed by the vastus intermedius, and the intermediate layer formed by the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. These two muscles here form this intermediate layer. You can see here superficial one, rectus femoris, deep one, the vastus intermedius, and in the middle, the layer formed by the rectus, uh, vastus medialis and vastus lateralis, all insert in the uh, superior pole of the patella. If we place the probe in this position, we will seek the bone of the patella here this is the image we need to find and you will notice the quadricipital tendon with the three layer shape the superficial layer the deep layer here and the middle intermediate layer here okay and between these layers some hyperechoic structure this is a, a lax connective tissue between these layers in order to allow some degree of uh, gliding between, between these three layers and usually in ultrasound hyperechoic. So we can use anisotropy to better have a better view of the tendons, as you can see here. Okay. Always when we perform an evaluation of a tendon, we need to uh, see this tendon in two planes. The first one is the longitudinal plane or, sag or sagittal plane and the second one is the short axis, short plane, the axial plane, sorry, here. This is the cadaver, this is the MRI and in this position, if you see the image, you will notice some kind of obliquity of the probe 
thus to um, achieve this anisotropy of the tendons. Because if we are perpendicular, we will see the tendon hyperchoic, as is the connective tissue. So it's very it's more difficult to distinguish between these structures. But if we use this obliquity, then the tendon becomes dark and the connective tissue is still hyperchoic. And we will distinguish very, very well all the components, deep layer, superficial layer, and intermediate layer here. Okay. Again, vastus intermedius, vastus medialis and vastus lateralis, and rectus femoris. Okay, now we are going to take a look to the patellar tendon. Sorry, this is not quadricipital, this is patellar tendon. Again, the cadaveric image and the three Teslas MRI. We place a probe over the tendon. We start, we always, I recommend you to always start in the distal edge of the patella here, because this is the most frequently affected area. So it's very important to have a very, very um, careful examination of this area here. Okay. And as you see in this reconstruction of the ultrasound, the patellar tendon has this fibrillar pattern, very, very homogeneous. Okay. And how it widens when it is, its insertion is in the tibia here, in the tubercle. patella, tibia, and the tendon, okay? Usually its width is five to four millimeters, but for me it's not, this is not a very important measure. You always must check its uh, echogenicity, this fibrillar pattern, very, very homogeneous in all these areas. So it's very important to have a very, very accurate, a very precise check of this tendon. Below, underneath the tendon, there is the um, Hoffa fat pad, okay? Very important too, and nowadays is uh, big, is, is becoming more important because of its implication with tendal, um, patellar tendinopathy, okay? So um, always perform this checking of the Hoffa, Hoffa fat pad. And very, very important, always perform these movements of the probe along all the length of the tendon and all the width. If you only place the probe in this, with this image and don't um, move the probe, so you will lose a lot of pathology because sometimes the tendinosis is very focal or even ruptures are very focal, so uh, very well uh, located and so you, you will miss these uh, injuries, always perform a complete uh, scan of the, all the tendon, very, very important. And to do so, it's very important the short axis. If you perform a scan in short axis from distal to proximal or from proximal to distal, it's very difficult to miss something, okay? So, this is the patellar tendon, cadaveric and MRI, and we zoom it, and with ultrasound, as you can see, a very, very nice image with this high resolution pattern inside the tendon, very, very homogeneous, okay? And very important to check. Always perform the scan from distal to proximal and you will never lose pathology at the patellar tendon. Okay, and now we are make a revision of the tendons of the extensor system. This is the patella, this is a panoramic view with the quadricipital tendon, the patella, and the patellar tendon. And as you can see, the extensor mechanism is a continuum. So, so the patella is not interrupting these two tendons. There are fibers communicating both tendons uh, passing above the patella. Okay. Here you can see a video, and uh, this is uh, um, the real image synchronized with the uh, ultrasound. We start proximal, we here are at the quads, okay? This one is the rectus femoris, and this one is the vastus intermedius. So 
the rectus femoris finishes here on its aponeurosis. Okay, but the vastus intermedius continues slightly distal. Okay, and you can notice here the aponeurosis of the rectus femoris forming the superficial layer, and here the superficial aponeurosis of the vastus intermedius forming the deep layer. As we continue distal, a third layer here between these two layers is a layer formed by the vastus medialis in this side. We are just in the middle, so we are not seeing the muscle, vastus medialis here, and in the other side will be the vastus lateralis forming this aponeurosis uh, of the both muscles which uh, will join and form a unique one in the middle of the quadricipital tendon and its insertion here you can see very well the three layers and this uh, lax tissue between them hyperechoic okay you see the fibrillar pattern of the tendon and this hyper hyperechoic layer uh, hyperechoic uh, structure between these layers and its insertion okay and how it continues above the patella and joins the patellar tendon with this fibrillar pattern and sorry and the hofafat pad just below underneath the patellar tendon okay so it's very easy to perform a good scan of all these anterior extensor system very very easy with ultrasound let's continue in this uh, side of the uh, of the knee we can find two fat pads three fat pads with a half of a pad but here above the patella there are two more the first one okay this is the quadricipital tendon the uh, femur patella and the first one is the suprapatellar fat pad okay with this triangular shape here okay you can see here the suprapatellar fat pad and the second one with this round shape is the prefemoral fat pad and be between these two fat pads you can see this honeycoic image sometimes it will be uh, bigger sometimes there will, you will not notice a honeycoic structure here this is the subquadricipital recess so if we are inside this image we are intraarticular and this is usually the way to inject intraarticular i don't know uh, prps or hyaluronic, uh, hyaluronic acid okay it's because it's very very well tolerated and easy to perform especially when you have some amount of uh, liquid inside of uh, effusion okay very very easy what about cartilage we can check trochlear cartilage if we ask the patient to perform this uh, uh, forced flexion then we will track the patella um, inferiorly and we will expose the cartilage of the trochlea and if we place the probe in the transverse orientation we can see the hyperechoic image of the cortical of the femur and an anechoic line parallel to this uh, bone cortical uh, with an anechoic image inside very very homogeneous this is the cartilage we need to check this integrity there is a thin uh, there's a clear limit between the cartilage and the fat pad here and there is all anechoic without um, changes inside the cartilage because sometimes we will find calcic deposit the deposits or um, or irregularities of the cortical of the femur it depends on the case okay but always check this cartilage usually it's very thick uh, 1.8 to 2.5 millimeters and it's the thickest of the body uh, so uh, just rem it's not important to remember this structure because I think that uh, the um, hom homogeneity and the anechoic pattern is more important. Okay, patellar cartilage 
can also be checked, but it's not easy to check to have a good uh, evaluation of the patellar cartilage. It's not easy, no, it's impossible to have a good evaluation of the patellar cartilage. But we can try to see something, okay? And that's why there's a dynamic maneuver pushing the patella, and we will translate this patella to the medial side. So the medial side of the patella may, may can be evaluated uh, somehow, okay? If we place a probe, uh, we need to place the, the patient with the uh, knee fully extended because we need the relaxation of the quads, of the extension mechanism, in order to achieve this movement. Because if the patient has is slightly flexed or is in tension with a, an uh, isometric contraction, you cannot uh, move the, uh, the patella. So it must be relaxed and in, in full uh, extension. And as you can see here, we can uh, obtain these images of the cartilage of the patella, the medial side of the patella. The lateral side, because it's hidden um, by the lateral trochlea, which is more prominent, is uh, if we don't have a, a lax patient with a very, very mobile patella, the lateral side of the patella, which is the most commonly affected, is very, very difficult to assess with ultrasound. So uh, just remember, we can assess uh, um, in not a good way the patellar, uh, patellar cartilage, but remember this maneuver to uh, check the medial side of the patella. About retinacula, we can check medial retinaculum. The retinaculum it has a very important um, role in stabilization of the patella and uh, we can if we, if we place the probe in the medial side above the patella we can see here this structure with these two uh, hypercoid layers so this is the medial retinaculum at some point it will be uh, thicker because of the medial uh, patellofemoral ligament uh, and we can perform all this checking of the medial retinaculum with the ultrasound Okay, always scan or uh, distal. And, and in the medial side, again, we if we place a probe, in this case, we are slightly distal at the patellar tendon, as you can see here. And again, this connective tissue, hyperechoic here, superficial, is the lateral retinaculum. Sorry, oops, here, the lateral retinaculum. Here you can use high frequency probes to obtain a better resolution and to have a, a better view of this uh, retinacula. And what about bursae? In the anterior side of the, of the knee, we have three bursae. First of all, the prepatellar bursae, here. Located between the anterior side, the superficial side of the patella and the skin very very superficial so in order to uh, don't uh, to, to in order to have a good view and don't push and don't um, reject the, the the bursa we can use this technique uh, called floating on which we place a good amount of gel and we place a probe uh, without pushing okay floating on this gel and in this position we can have this image here, this is the skin, so this is the gel. As you can notice, the, the probe is not touching the skin, okay? And this is a way to have a good evaluation on a small bursitis, okay? Normally, in this location, uh, the bursa is not seen because it's hidden. It's, uh, it's a virtual structure because it has no liquid inside. So we will see this image of the um, of the skin of the subcutaneous tissue without any liquid, any anechoic image. Usually it's located here, but uh, take into account that it, it can be very, very big, the image of the bursa here. And there are two ber more bursae, bursae, sorry, pronunciation, okay, bursae, um, the infrapatellar ones. The superficial infrapatellar bursa and the deep infrapatellar bursa. The superficial will be here between the 
uh, distal patellar tendon and the skin and between the distal patellar tendon and the tibia the bone the tibial bone there's the deep infrapatellar bursa here again the superficial patellar bursa usually is located here and uh, if you see some amount of liquid it's pathologic okay always always no liquid inside the bursa in normal people but in the other, in the other hand in the infrapatellar deep uh, deep infrapatellar bursa here you can notice some amount of liquid and it's not pathologic so if you have doubts compare with the control trial side and always the clinic okay usually the bursitis here is accompanied with uh, ten, uh, tendinosis or some kind of affection of the distal patellar tendon okay is uh, isolated is very rare and here is an example of a bursa with liquid and this is a rare example because the tendon is very uh, has a good image but you, here you can see the bursa with some uh, excessive amount of liquid inside so if with uh, pain in this area it will be uh, diagnosed as burs uh, bursitis okay and that was all I wanted to tell you about the anterior side of the knee um, very very useful very common in daily practice and I hope you like it thank you very much